But I've been in Rome now for almost 30 years, since 92, and uh, uh, Rome is my passion, Rome is my love, uh, and I know that the Sistine Chapel attracts so much attention, and rightfully so. And uh, um, later on, maybe we'll be talking, there will be uh, time, of course, for questions. The presentation itself will take approximately 45 minutes, uh, and then there will be time for you to ask questions, and if anyone has been, uh, to Rome and to the Vatican, it would be interesting to maybe hear also um, something that you've noticed that's different, that surprised you. And um, I hope you will enjoy the presentation. And my idea of presenting the, the Sistine Chapel was uh, uh, starting from where, it, where is it? Uh, what is it the part of? Uh, it's the part of the Vatican City State. It's the private Pope's Chapel and uh, the Vatican City State came into existence as we know it uh, uh, as the smallest, the smallest state in the world, 110 acres, in 1929. Uh, before that, throughout 2000 years of history, the Popes have first uh, uh, become like the cohesive force uh, uh, in, in Italy, then in Europe, then uh, quite, quite internationally, especially in the Western Hemisphere. But uh, the church emerges on the ruins of the Roman Empire as uh, the new infrastructure, as also social assistance, and uh, uh, Rome becomes the, the capital of the Christianity. And that is thanks to the tomb of St. Peter, who's buried in the Basilica of St. Peter's, which was 2,000 years ago in the first century, first ancient Roman stadium with the cemetery outside. That's where Peter dies, he's crucified and buried, uh, and his tomb is now in the uh, so-called scavi, or excavations uh, uh, underneath the St. Peter's Basilica. And um, the Sistine Chapel, again, the private chapel of the Popes, is right next, next. to the dome of St. Peter, next to the Basilica, and this picture was actually taken from the top of the dome. You will see when I show you uh, the rest of the environment. And uh, I have named this presentation the Sistine Chapel, and then between brackets, uh, without secrets, because uh, it's been known recently, you know, all the books and movies and everybody's talking about secrets here, secrets there. So uh, that's, that's a good marketing tool, I believe, to mention some kind of a secret. So uh, it was just jokingly called it without secrets. I hope I will be able to reveal some truths about what, who knows, you know, some facts, maybe, the truths, who knows what the truth is about anything. Now, this is a larger uh, picture you see the um, the Sistine Chapel right now, right be at the bottom of the screen, and uh, uh, and I can use a little spotlight, so I will I will do that. Hope everyone can see it. Maybe it will make things easier. So here is again the roof of the Sistine Chapel, and uh, uh, maybe some of you are looking at it now. Where is the chimney? Well, we know that when the Pope dies, uh, uh, there's the conclave, the meeting of the cardinals who are uh, choosing the new Pope among them, but uh, the stove and the chimney are mounted for the occasion, so the chimney is not there right now. And uh, um, normally, when the conclave takes place, now right here where I've put my little red dot on the roof, that's where the chimney comes out, because uh, the stove is inside the chapel, and it's here at this corner, uh, which is um, southeast, and uh, the chimney then uh, comes out and then goes up and then in somehow. Here, are the, these are the windows of the Sistine Chapel. You see, look down there at the bottom. And then it goes up and then in and then comes out. And they have like a little fan at the bottom to send the, the smoke up. And if the smoke is black, no Pope. If the smoke is white, Habemus Papa, we have the new, the new Pope. And uh, uh, so these are the Vatican museums. And uh, I'm now here at the top on the left with my little red uh, spotlight and uh, uh, this is the entrance to the Vatican Museum. So this is where we enter. These people here are taking pictures uh, of the Dome of St. Peter's. Then we go through this so-called courtyard of the pine cone. I'm going to show you briefly, you know, the, um, the route that we take on the way to the chapel. Then through the gallery of the statues, actually the, the octagonal courtyard with some beautiful, beautiful ancient Roman statues. And then uh, through these galleries, see I'm dragging the spotlight, we see the more statues, uh, uh, tapestries, uh, maps, uh, and then um, people usually choose uh, to do 
that they have to choose between the shorter and the, and the longer tour, which is offered. Uh, obviously, they can either go straight into the Sistine Chapel or go through the so-called Raphael's rooms, uh, the rooms painted for the Pope Julius II by uh, Raphael, the contemporary of Michelangelo, and then uh, the route takes you through the modern and contemporary art, which is actually really outstanding. There's Matisse and Van Gogh and uh, uh, Francis Bacon, Dali, to name just, uh, just a few. And then the Sistine Chapel uh, itself. So uh, the Vatican city-state, uh, again, remember I did mention how it is the, um, the smallest state in the world. And so now once again, here is the Sistine Chapel. I mean, I'm circling it with my little red spotlight. This is St. Peter's Basilica. This is the St. Peter's Square. And these are the walls. Uh, they're mainly, uh, most of the wall is ancient between the 14th, 15th, 16th century. Um, it's a containing wall. It's not just a defense wall, but a containing wall because the Vatican is actually a sort of a hill. So building anything uh, without containing the clay, uh, the, the terrain contains a lot of clay, uh, would make those foundations shift. So there's, uh, there's a wall. And the residential part of the Vatican is mainly here at the, at the bottom. That's where the current Pope lives today. Uh, and normally, I'm pointing out the residence of the Pope, uh, the papal apartments are in this building overlooking the, the, the St. Peter's Square. Uh, the Pope does show up uh, for the blessing every Sunday, 12 o'clock, uh, at, um, at the window of the papal apartments, and uh, he respects, of course, the, the tradition, but he doesn't, doesn't live there. And there are more apartments, offices, uh, uh, the barracks, uh, so-called barracks for the, for the Swiss guards and so on. But the Swiss guards you don't see at the Vatican museums, you see them here at the Basilica of St. Peter's. And uh, this is the dome from which that picture was taken, the one that we saw earlier. And this is the Sistine Chapel. This little, little roof here with the lightning rod, that's the Sistine Chapel. And uh, doesn't, it looks very small because it's dwarfed by by St. Peter's. And now, so when we start the tour, this is me doing my job and hopefully uh, I'll get back doing it. Sistine Chapel is rarely this empty normally. I work for this uh, big American tour operator, Talk, our talk, and uh, we do the evening visits or I do private visits earlier in the morning when there are less crowds normally. Who knows what's going to happen in the, in the future, but I'm showing you. This is one of the evenings uh, uh, with, uh, with Talk. That's why I don't see many people, it's just uh, our, our clients. This is a famous double staircase uh, that was designed in 1932, so three years after the foundation of the Vatican City State, the Pope starts the collection of art. It became very prestigious 500 years ago during the Renaissance times to collect uh, ancient art. And you see people uh, going down. Uh, this is now just the exit. The staircase is double, so one uh, pair of one spiral stairs is used to go was used to go up and one to go down. Now it's just the exit because there's a new entrance since the year 2000 to accommodate the ever-growing number of visitors. Uh, if it looks um, vaguely uh, familiar, just think of Frank Lloyd Wright and Guggenheim in New York. He was in the Vatican City State and he was inspired by this uh, staircase. This is the view of the dome from the Vatican Museums, where we saw people taking pictures from. This is the famous courtyard of the pine cone with this ancient pine cone that was found near the Pantheon in the center of Rome. It dates back to the second century uh, AD. In the middle is the um, sphere within sphere by uh, this contemporary artist Pomodoro. Uh, he donated it to the Vatican Museums uh, around the year 2000. This is now a closer view of the, of the sphere, again with the view of the dome. And this is uh, something that we have to explain even though uh, it doesn't make directly part of the Sistine Chapel, but this ancient statue that goes back to the second century BC uh, inspired Michelangelo tremendously for his muscular frames. Uh, even his women are overly muscular. That was simply his artistic expression uh, the inner strength of his personalities uh, was expressed through their physical appearance. And that's something that starts in his 30s when he lays his eyes uh, on the Pope's collection on some of the statues, especially this one. It's so intense uh, that it inspired many artists. For example, uh, this is not so well known, but there was an exhibition in Florence 
with several drawings by Jackson Pollock, no other than Jackson Pollock of the famous uh, torso. And Rodin's Thinker uh, is the most famous statue inspired by the torso. And uh, again, less known, uh, this is just a screenshot when I Google Van Gogh torso. Uh, so there are these sketches of not just Venus, but also of the torso that even Van Gogh, uh, he didn't come to Rome to, to visit, of course, but um, he had a book of uh, uh, sketches and, and drawings and uh, um, the prints, actually. And he copied from there. He was studying like that. So he saw um, a print with, with the torso. And this is another statue that you can't skip. Uh, let's just imagine 500 years ago, 1506, a farmer near the Colosseum is uh, trying to plant a tree and oops, he runs into an ancient statue and he knows that the Pope is paying a lot of money, Julius II was paying for these ancient statues. And uh, he calls the Pope, the Pope calls Michelangelo and probably when Michelangelo looked at this six pack, he thought to himself, you know, these ancient sculptors, they were able to, to carve and express themselves so amazingly. I should start to do something similar because think of the Renaissance, first the medieval art, thousand years of very static art, no freestanding statues. Then we have the Renaissance in Florence, uh, Donatello, finally some statues are standing, but kind of shy and nobody's moving. While this poor statue looks like somebody who's trying to put their coat in the car, you know, there's so much intensity in it. And that's a, that's a Facebook meme, you know, they're trying to make the art uh, uh, closer to young generations. So they come up with these um, funny lines. But uh, the, the personality is the priest from Troy, uh, who famously said, beware of the Greeks bearing gifts. Uh, when he saw the horse that Trojans were convinced uh, was, uh, was a gift. Well, it wasn't the Greek. Uh, warriors were in it and uh, so he almost ruined the plans of the Greek gods to conquer Troy for the Greeks and Poseidon sent these horrible snakes to uh, kill the priest and his little boys. Uh, pay attention to something that will come out later, the boys. Uh, the one on the right, his little body is so tense and he's desperate the desperate look in his eyes and uh, uh, his muscles are tense, but they're so much smaller and tender with respect to his father. Well, the boy on the left is limp. He either fainted or, or died already. And there are no muscles, there's no tension under his skin. And I'll, I'll get back to that uh, somehow uh, later. Now, uh, Hercules, I wanted to show you this Roman copy uh, made after a lost Greek prototype because this would have been a type of statue that influenced Michelangelo as well. He saw Hercules, which is now in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. Most of the statues you see at the museums are actually Roman copies after lost Greek uh, prototypes or originals that go back to 5th, 6th century BC sometimes. Most of the time, 5th but Roman uh, mainly second because that was the, uh, the longest period of well-being. So they invested into art. Then you pass through the uh, room with the tapestries with absolutely amazing resurrection of Christ uh, that actually shifts as you walk. We'll have to do a special tour on that. And then after that, the gallery of maps, amazing ceiling that seems like, oh my God, are we in the Sistine Chapel? Well, not yet. We still have to go through the so-called Raphael's rooms. The most famous uh, um, fresco would be so-called School of Athens, where Raphael painted um, the most important philosophers of all times. Uh, uh, this is a triumph of truth. You know, the Renaissance was a perfect marriage between the classical knowledge and the, and the Christianity. That's why we see, for example, this is Socrates, his teaching with his um, fingers like that. And then uh, Plato pointing to the sky, idealistic philosophy. This is the portrait of Leonardo da Vinci, Aristotle, Diogenes, then Pythagoras, then the Arab philosopher Averroe, who introduced Aristotle's philosophy to the Arabs during their golden age in the Middle Ages. And for us, most interestingly, there is this huge figure here, looks completely different than everyone else. Now, you must know that Raphael and Michelangelo worked at the same time for the same Pope, Raphael painting the apartments, Michelangelo painting the private chapel, 
and they did not really like each other. There was a lot of rivalry. There are all these little gossip stories. Who knows how much of that is really truth. But uh, they say Raphael uh, one night sneaked into the Sistine Chapel, fell in love with those I call them grumpy giants, and, and came back and painted uh, Michelangelo as Heraclitus, the one who said Pantarei, everything is flowing. And he painted Michelangelo the way he would have painted himself. He became Michelangelesque, like most of the painters in the 1500s, wherever you look around, there are these muscular big frames. It's like Picasso when he put the mouth on the forehead, all of a sudden, all the painters became Cubist. Uh, so uh, at that time, 500 years ago, they became Michelangelesque. So let's go and see what impressed Raphael so much. Uh, this is the view of the Last Judgment, which Michelangelo painted when he was in his 60s. And uh, we'll get to the ceiling, obviously. Uh, the door on the right-hand side, where I'm dragging my, my spotlight, this is where people enter from the Vatican Museums. And here is the main altar. And the little door he here <clears throat> is the so-called Room of the, of the Tears. Uh, because when the Pope is chosen in the Sistine Chapel, then, uh, of course, it's very emotional. He goes into the little room, probably cries, and there are all these outfits, small, medium, large, and then the Pope chooses him. This one is too tight, you know. So, uh, and he, he then shows up at the balcony of the blessings in the middle of the Basilica of St. Peter's facade. But in the meantime, of course, he has to collect his thoughts and pray and um, shed a tear or two, we guess. So that's why they call this room the, the Room of the Tears. So that's the last judgment, we'll get back to it, because it's the third phase of the decorations of the Sistine Chapel, which was built in the 1470s, 1471. And uh, now I will show you the opposite side. Uh, on the opposite side uh, is the door, the gate that leads to uh, first, the, like the Royal Hall, Sala Ducale, where the Pope receives most important delegations. It's not open to public. And I only saw it once in my 16 years as licensed tour guide in Rome because uh, a friend had uh, um, clients who were the donors who donate money for the restoration of the works, uh, works of art at the Vatican. So we had internal tour, that was really amazing. Anyway, the Pope arriving <clears throat> in the longer run from his apartment enters the chapel from that gate and the whole ceiling was painted to be observed from that point not from where we enter normally from the museum. So that's why now if you're looking at the ceiling, it's all upside down because it wasn't meant to be observed from the last judgment, but from the opposite side. And uh, on the left are the frescoes from 1470s and 80s, Life of Christ. And on the right, you will see there will be Life of Moses. So those were painted uh, by previous uh, generation of painters. You see, this is now a larger picture, this is the entrance here. This division that you see is division between the, uh, the, um, the clergy and the visitors, normally, because we are at the Vatican, so <clears throat> most likely there would be quite a lot of clergy. So here are the frescoes painted by Perugino, Botticelli, Ghirlandaio, Rosselli, again, Life of Christ on the left as you enter. Right now it's on our right-hand side. And here is Life of Moses on our left. So Old Testament, New Testament. And uh, when Michelangelo came 30 years later, he had to measure himself, measure himself up with the best of the best. And he also wasn't really happy with just painting all oh, 12 apostles and Mary with the baby and Jesus on the cross and that position. That, no, that was way too simple for him. And uh, uh, he decided to connect the Old Testament with the New Testament by painting, you see here in the arches, there are these uh, people, sad people in the triangles. So triangles and arches are the ancestors of Jesus starting from the house of King David. So that's how the two are connected. And then uh, in between are these huge figures. So this one dominates, we'll get to him. He's absolutely fascinating, the prophet Jonah. There are 12 and uh, anybody in his right mind would have painted 12 apostles. Well, Michelangelo, thank God, was not that much in his right mind in a good sense. So he painted uh, seven prophets from the Old Testament and five prophetesses from the temples of Apollo. So they're neither Old Testament nor New Testament, but according to the poet Virgil, 
they had a vision of another virgin birth. For example, the founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, were born to a Vestal Virgin and God Mars, according to the ancient Roman legend. So he says it's going to happen again and the boy will save the world. So that's what puts the Sibyls, the prophetesses, on the same level with the prophets of the Old Testament. They lived before Jesus and they saw the arrival of Messiah. Now, Michelangelo is the first artist who painted something uh, elaborate on a ceiling. Before that, the ceiling was uh, typically uh, late Gothic, Gothic, uh, blue with golden stars. That was about it. But in order to handle the big space, uh, he divided it into uh, nine panels and decided to paint the creation of the world in the, in the center. So again, uh, just very briefly, these are the painters he had to measure himself up with. See where you enter, the baptism of Christ. I'll just show you a few, not all of them. This was Perugino. Uh, then we have famous Botticelli. And you see this figure looks like his Primavera in Florence, the one on the right. These are Temptations of Christ. The delivery of the keys. Now, this one is really significant because uh, not just it's pure perfection as far as Renaissance goes. You see how it goes in the 1400s. They rediscovered the mass behind the perspective. So things become smaller if they're farther away. Fine enough. So for about 100 years, it's about this um, very mathematical, geometrical uh, perspective, vanishing point. So we have pure symmetry. And Michelangelo just breaks all those rules. He says, I have to move. There's no movement here, no emotions, no intensity. It's perfect, it's beautiful. And uh, you will see what he did. And after what he did, it was impossible to go back to this. We'll get to that. And then a beautiful Last Supper, uh, not by Leonardo da Vinci, which is in Milan, but by um, Cosimo Rosselli, one of the team. Uh, these are the apostles, uh, and uh, uh, curiously enough, this is Judas. He's turned to us with his back, and his halo is gray, and he's got a little demon right here on his shoulder whispering into his ear, telling him all the bad things. So this is quite, uh, quite an amazing uh, Last Supper, beautifully done. And then just a couple of uh, uh, frescoes, the ones that I could find the good pictures of as well. Uh, this is Sandro Botticelli. Uh, the moment when Moses talks to the burning bush, uh, gets ready for the trip, uh, meets his future wife, Sephora, at the well with her, <clears throat> with her sister. And this beautiful girl, actually, well, it's the same, same girl, may look familiar. It's the same girl. You know, the birth of Venus, which is in Florence in the Uffizi Gallery, she was related to Amerigo Vespucci. She was married to his nephew. So six levels of separation, you know. This girl, uh, I call her the Renaissance Barbie. Uh, she was the most beautiful girl in Florence, unfortunately died young, but was a great inspiration to Botticelli. So now uh, the east wall is the, in the back the one with the gate that leads to uh, the Pope's premises. And uh, uh, the stove is here in this corner. So just to give an orientation, this is the end of life of Moses here. The Last Supper is here. So we're looking at the Sistine Chapel from the entrance. And again, the ceiling is turned upside down because that's not the point from which it should be observed. Now, uh, this is how the ceiling looks, uh, uh, in, I cannot say really, in, well, in order, yes, but there's not so much of the chronological order. You, you will see. Uh, what I really like about Michelangelo dividing the ceiling is also how he put a little bit of a blue sky here. He just painted it to create the illusion of lightness. And uh, he started painting here, where you see first uh, uh, the drunkenness of Noah, then the flood, where a piece of the uh, stucco fell off a couple of hundred years ago. And then building of the altar. This is Adam and Eve before and after the sin. And now, of course, before that was creation of Eve, creation of Adam, uh, division of the earth from the waters, uh, creation of planets. And at the very beginning, that is right above your head as you enter, is creation of light. And again, Jonah dominates the whole 
chapel. He's like a precursor of Christ in the Old Testament. Three days in the whale or Leviathan versus the, the three days in the tomb and the resurrection. And here is a, a bad copy, but I was very careful about uh, copyright. So the best one I could find about uh, the drunkness of Noah, uh, where Michelangelo is, you see how he's um, uh, exercising his skill in uh, uh, painting the bodies that would resemble ancient statues. That's typically, typically Renaissance. This is the flood that looks quite clumsy with respect to his uh, later frescoes, which reach absolute uh, perfection. You see these people uh, will not be saved because only those who are at the ark uh, will, be, will be saved. There's so much to say about everything Michelangelo done, really uh, scratching the surface, uh, scratching the surface tonight. And uh, now to give you a little better idea with the better photo, again, as you enter, here is God creating the light, then God creating the planets. Here is a yellow big, big disc, that's the sun. Here is the moon. And then uh, God dividing the land from the waters, creating Adam. We're going to dedicate some more time to that one. And then here is uh, uh, Daniel, uh, the prophet. Here is a beautiful, beautiful Sibyl from Libya, which was part of the Roman Empire from Kuma, an elderly lady. Kuma was near Naples. Kuma is near Naples, but um, this was a Sibyl from the temple of Apollo, the prophetess. Now, this is the first one. The first day of creation. Uh, here is God with his arms extended. And if these inudi, the nudes, or wingless angels remind you of anything, of course, it's the torso, uh, the one that impressed <clears throat> so many artists. These are Michelangelo's sketches how he imagined the torso would have been when it were uh, entire. And then uh, a bit of a better view of the creation of the planets. Here is the, the moon, the sun, then God is turning around and he's mooning us practically. Right here, there are a lot of little stories and gossip about that. And, uh, uh, and then uh, the vegetation. There's a really good book called Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling. And since Michelangelo uh, did not leave any notes, uh, the book's can afford to have different approach to what Michelangelo may have had in mind, but the truth is we don't know. That's the terrible truth. Now maybe that's good. So here's the face of God, a tremendous face of God, just to get it a little bit closer to you, you know how he worked on the, on the fresh uh, plaster, which is absolutely uh, one of the most difficult uh, expressions in art because of the layers and the humidity and the pigment that you don't see until it's dry. And uh, uh, you see these little, little dots and lines uh, on the cartoons that you use um, the, cart the charcoal dust uh, uh, to make it penetrate through the little hole so you have like the outline to paint. It's extremely, extremely difficult uh, technique. And uh, so here is the separation of the earth from the waters. And you see, we're all, he's already really, really good at what we call 3D today, but uh, it would be foreshortening <clears throat> or scorcio in Italian. And here's the famous, the most famous, obviously, uh, the creation of Adam. God is floating on this cloud that might as well be the shape of human brain. And uh, uh, he has the face of a mature man and the body of the man in his prime. So he's transmitting both strength and wisdom. And Adam is, apart from very handsome, uh, is a, a cretin, strange creature. You know, why is he not standing in front of God? You know, that would be uh, more respectful. Actually, he's not standing because he can't. If you look at his body a bit closer, he's receiving life. He's made of clay, dust, clay, mud. And life has reached this arm, his head, his neck, his left chest, his left leg, but his right leg and his right arm, they're still not alive. So he can't stand. And uh, uh, even better, look at his chest. You see the nipple closer to God is alive. And the one on the right, mm -mm, not yet. So we are practically witnessing the creation. And I guess Adam was bored after that, so God created Eve. There's the continuation. Always with the torsos, the inudi or the nudes, wingless angels. And another amazing one, the fall and expulsion from heaven. 
where the she snake is tempting this gorgeous muscular Eve. And Adam is also reaching for the knowledge. Look at his arm. He's not waiting passively uh, to be tempted, but this dry branch in heaven announces uh, the catastrophe that's coming. And here is the avenging angel and completely desert uh, landscape, deserted landscape. And the, 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 the two of them are so desperate, uh, so intense. And uh, uh, now I will show you something that um, will show Michelangelo's respect for another artist, which was very rare. And uh, rightfully so, he was the greatest. And uh, uh, he did appreciate a few artists, but um, the one that he appreciated the most lived 100 years earlier. And had he lived a longer life, he died, he was only 27. His name was Masaccio. Had he lived a longer life, he would have been the greatest of them all, most likely. And just uh, uh, look once again at Adam and Eve and the Avenging Angel, and I'm going to show you Masaccio, 100 years earlier, in Florence, in the Church of Carmine. So this is an homage. I don't think Michelangelo needed to copy anyone. If he painted this, it was because he wanted to show his respect for, his young, for this young artist who died 100 years earlier, in 1427. So now, just a closer look at the beautiful Sibyl, Libyan Sibyl, with, his, with her movement, you know, either opening or closing a book, prophets, prophetesses, they're always dealing with some, some books. And Isaiah, uh, these very muscular Michelangelo statue of Moses, for example, you know, there's this monumental stance uh, to them. And Here's uh, one of the lunettes I wanted to show you, at least one with David and Solomon, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the connecting of the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament. So uh, in each lunette, there are the names written. It's like a family tree or a chain uh, between King David and, uh, and Jesus. And now the last judgment, 30 years have passed. Now we are in the uh, 1530s uh, and uh, Michelangelo is in his 60s. The Pope <clears throat> wants to cover two frescoes, beginning of life of Jesus and Moses and Mary's assumption, close two windows and paint a big last judgment. Well, the last judgments were quite common in the cathedrals and the most important churches. And uh, uh, Michelangelo at that point uh, mastered the trade. So you see how the space is huge but he mastered it. He didn't need to divide, to divide uh, geometrically uh, the space, but uh, he did divide it, uh, not strictly, but uh, thematically. For example, here in the center at the bottom uh, are, is a group of angels blowing in the trumpets. They're announcing the apocalypse. And Jesus, flanked by Mary and the saints, is... Uh, um, deciding who's going to burn in hell forever. So look at the bottom to the right, you see the river sticks, the current is pushing the sinners into hell. Uh, here is Minos, the judge, he's going to decide how many layers of hell they have to go down. While uh, here on the left are the people resurrecting from their tombs and they're helped by these wingless angels to come up and join the souls in heaven. Here is John the Baptist who looks like Hercules, there's Peter, giving back the keys. Here is Saint Lawrence, uh, uh, also the sketch of Torzo, and uh, he's holding on a giridon. There is a strange word which I never mastered in English. Giridon, giridon, uh, grid, or not really the grid, but the grill of a sort. And uh, uh, he was, uh, poor thing, he was uh, grilled alive. And uh, he is the, one of the early Christian martyrs. And this is Saint Bartholomew. I'll, I'll get back to him and his, and his skin. He was flayed and ancient Romans did that. And here in the arches, we see the angels carry the instruments of Christ, fashion the cross and the column of the flagellation. Here in between Jonah's feet is a little witness, that's how we call them, of these uh, uh, stains that were left on purpose to be able to compare how it was before the cleaning in the 1980s and, uh, and later, because they used the oil lamps and candles and you know later on pollution, the dirt, the dust. Uh, uh, so there are uh, here too. Look at the bottom here, the blue sky, and there is a cute little so-called witness. And uh, uh, so let me show you a few more details. This is the main altar, uh, and uh, uh, here you see. This is absolutely amazing how Michelangelo painted these demons in hell. But look at this one. He's scared. 
What is he scared of? He's in hell, you know, that's his territory. Well, uh, this is the interaction between the fresco and what's outside of it. I mean, artists will do that 100 years later, like Bernini, but Michelangelo is an absolute pioneer. This demon on the fresco is afraid of the cross outside of it because he knew there would be the main altar there. And here the demons are still fighting for the soul, they're holding on to them, the skeletons are getting their flesh back, but the, uh, the angels are helping them. Uh, here on the boat, we see all kinds of little sinners. And uh, uh, in between these three big gray uh, nude bodies, there is a face that is believed to be Martin Luther in gray robe. Uh, now, don't, don't take my word for it, but there are all these little legends, and uh, he's the only, like, in a gray robe, and uh, there was this big uh, split in the Catholic Church right at that time. Martin Luther never accepted offers for reconciliation, and Michelangelo was uh, uh, very much for the unity of the, of the Church. Now, that's a bit of a longer story. Now, here is the uh, St. Bartholomew holding his skin, and the knife, the symbol of his martyrdom, because again, he was flayed. He was one of the 12 apostles. That's his own skin. But if you look at the skin, the symbol of his martyrdom, and we compare the face on it with his face, you'll see mm -mm, that's not the same, uh, same face, right? Well, famously, this is believed to be the self-portrait of Michelangelo. And why did he put it right there? You know, the artists love to say, I'll put my self-portrait here and there. But right on the skin of St. Bartholomew, maybe he was ready to die. Maybe uh, he was waiting for the resurrection himself. Uh, uh, you know, he was in his 60s. He lived to be 89. But that wasn't something that would normally be, be expected. So why exactly there are so many uh, ideas, insinuations, but again, without his own explanation, we'll, we'll never know. This is a little detail of demons uh, uh, falling into hell. Uh, you see these, mm, I call them speedos, uh, uh, were painted after Michelangelo died. You know how classical statues, Greek and Roman statues were nude. And the nudity was uh, heroic, uh, it was uh, uh, divine, and uh, it was athletic. So it was celebrated, male nudity especially, female as well. There are graces, there are nymphs, there's Venus, the goddess of love but generally the nudity was identified with higher ideals, the perfect nudity, obviously. And then with the, the Protestantism, with the Reformation, counter-Reformation, the nudity becomes a no-no. So uh, the speedos were painted, but when Michelangelo died by a poor artist who then got the nickname like the, um, the knickers, I cannot say speedos, but the lebrage, uh, poor guy, he was forced to do that. He was Michelangelo's pupil and a friend, and uh, he ended up with this nickname of the knickers, poor Volterra. And anyway, this is the, uh, the scene of the Last Judgment, the selected ones. You see how the, the wingless angel is helping these people uh, resurrect and join the souls in heaven by using the rosary which became very important with, uh, with the Counter-Reformation. This is before the cleaning. You see how uh, the fresco is in a very bad shape, but I wanted to show you that as well. And uh, this is a copy by another Michelangelo's pupil and friend, which is kept at the museum in Naples, uh, Capo di Monte. And this is how we know who was nude, who wasn't. Because you know how artists paint the, the copies of the works of art, their study. And uh, uh, you look at the personalities, especially here to the right, uh, there's a, a naked lady. Uh, that's St. Catherine of Alexandria. She was covered with a green dress later. So a lot of changes. Uh, some of the speedos were removed during the cleaning in the 1980s. Some were kept as a part of history because that's also history. That's where the fig leaves come into, into the picture in the 15, 1600s. I always like not to ignore the floor because it's such a, a testimony to the past because it's a late medieval floor and it's made of the bits and pieces uh, of uh, marble used for ancient Roman, um, not statues, but uh, uh, the linings of the walls and the monuments. Uh, uh, it was recycled like that in these beautiful, beautiful medieval um, floors. Promise to show you the stove. Uh, this is without the big chimney, but that's how it, the famous stove uh, used uh, for the conclave. In the past, they would uh, throw water on the flame to create the, the, the steam to make it white. Today, they use chemicals, so it's easy to have black or white smoke. 
And this is the view from the southeast corner. That's when you leave the chapel and you look back at it and say, would I ever be uh, able to, to really remember all that and absorb all that? It's absolutely stunning. And uh, again, Jonah, good old Jonah, is uh, um, dominating the view. He's uh, leaning backwards. He's coming out with his knees. He can do whatever he wants with the space. Remember those keys now the delivery of the keys, how lovely they were. But once you've seen Jonah, you cannot go back to painting those vanishing points. Uh, that's, that's over. And now what and who inspired Jonah? Uh, despite Michelangelo for Jonah, let's just go back to good old Laocoon. Uh, the priest, remember what we saw. Here's Jonah, here's Laocoon, and things kind of fall into place. And uh, could anyone imagine all of that uh, um, behind this nondescript wall? This is the view of the Sistine Chapel from the Vatican Gardens. You look at it, it looks like, uh, well, just another fortress of a sort, but uh, it hides this incredible jewel that I hope will survive forever. And I believe I wrapped it up exactly at 45 minutes. Wow, that was wonderful, Olga. Thank you. Um, we have some time. If you want to stop sharing the screen, we can see if anybody has any questions or comments. I was there in October. Yeah. I toured Rome and the Sistine Chapel, so this is a review for me. And there are also a few things I learned that you didn't go into, but you can't go into everything. Oh, <laughs> I mean, there's that region of the world goes back 5,000 years or more. And you know, in the United States, we've been here for 300. So there's, there's so much more there. Absolutely, absolutely. Rome is bottomless. You know, I would say it would take about three lifetimes to get to know Rome properly. And one of those lifetimes just in the Vatican museums. Um, Tom Cross uh, asked if, is there a book I can read about the Sistine Chapel and all the ancient characters? Um, to improve my knowledge of all you've shared with us? Uh, as far as the Sistine Chapel goes, there are three books uh, I could recommend. Uh, one is the good old Irving Stone, Agony and Ecstasy. That is also the movie uh, with, uh, I always forget, is it Kirk Douglas or Charlton Heston? No, it was Kirk Douglas, I believe. He played Michelangelo. And uh, uh, that's a, a great uh, uh, biography of Michelangelo. And then uh, more specifically into the ceiling, there's a book by King Ross or Ross King. I never know which one is his name and the last name, but King Ross. And he wrote Michelangelo and the Pope's ceiling. So that's a really good one. And uh, if you want to have more and more fun, something lighter and uh, talking about the secrets, uh, a rabbi, a rabbi wrote a book called The Secrets of the Sistine Chapel. And uh, I think it's Dol Ray Dolan. But anyway, Secrets of the Sistine Chapel, and, and it will pop up. And uh, he's, a bit out, he's a bit overstretched in some things. He sees uh, Hebrew letters everywhere. But I must say, a lot of the things that I would normally use also in my tour, uh, there's there these little two Jewish uh, gentlemen in The Last Judgment. Uh, you know, there are a lot of little interesting things that he noticed. And apart from the Jewish side of things, uh, uh, it, is, it is a fun and quite well-documented book. So if you want something lighter, uh, that is, so The Secrets of the Sistine Chapel by Roy Dolan, and then um, King Ross, uh, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling, and uh, uh, older book, uh, Irving Stone, um, Agony and Ecstasy. For now. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and I did type them, but I typed them to the waiting room. So, Tom, I'm going to, as other people talk, I'll type them into the chat. I may be wrong in some detail. Is it, is it Roy Dolan exactly? That's how you spell his name? Or I can, I can send it to you, Carolyn. Okay. Exactly, the, the list and something else. Because some things I just overheard or read in an article or... There's so much. But let's say that these three, there are three different books and uh, uh, there's something for, for every taste. They, they uh, offer a different kind of information. Wonderful. Different approach, not really different information so much, but different approach. All right, I am typing them in the chat. 
Anybody else? There they are. <clears throat> Let's see. It should be Roy Dolan. Hmm. I even know him personally because uh, he used to live in Rome. Ah. And uh, uh, then he moved to Jerusalem. I saw him in Jerusalem actually in, in January because we were there with a group of tour guides from Rome and he came to talk about a statue that he uh, examined that he believes is Michelangelo. Awesome. Yes, um, Tom, I'm so inspired by the amazing talent of all the artists that painted the Sistine Chapel. I, I, I concur. Well, actually, I'm startled by the amazing knowledge of Olga. <laughs> you have studied you, these paintings and the people in them. It's unbelievable. You are such a student. And thank, thank you. you thank you. <laughs> Olga, you mentioned the uh, speedos being painted yes. on Michelangelo's <laughs> mm -hmm. masterpieces. Were there any yes. other changes like that? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, not that visible, but uh, um, for example, the biggest change was uh, uh, St. Catherine of Alexandria. Uh, she was completely nude and right behind her was St. Blaise looking down at her naked behind. Now both of them were drastically changed, uh, uh, not just by painting over on dry plaster, but completely scraping the plaster, new layer, and then it was impossible to go back to the original. But St. Blaise now looks properly at Jesus and uh, St. Catherine is completely dressed. But that, that's a visible one. That's the part of those uh, uh, interventions. But for example, the hand of Adam, uh, when he touches God, they only discovered that uh, during the, the cleaning in the 1980s. Uh, they cleaned the dirt because, you know, every once in a while, uh, to, in order to preserve uh, the frescoes which are cracking, they thought that passing brushing with the, uh, animal glue uh, would preserve the frescoes and give them a little brightness. It did for a while, but then it attracted every particle of soot and dirt. And once they cleaned that, they realized there were many patches where the plaster actually fell off because it's old. And Adam's figures uh, were painted by another painter. They're entirely ugly and horrible. Mm. But <laughs> that, that, piece, that piece fell off. The, these, uh, he's holding his fingers like that, these two fingers. But it's obviously not, not, not visible. It's really, you have to go all the way up on those scaffoldings and, uh, and see that. So major changes, no, but things like that. They, they couldn't reach the ceiling to add the speedos, so... Or the Pope who wanted to reach them, they, they arrive with the scaffoldings, but the poof, and then he dies. And then the next Pope says, oh, whatever. So he goes on to something else, and anyway, they never managed to alter the, the ceiling that way. Olga, do you do private tours once we're all traveling again, or do you work only for tours? Yes, yes, I do. That's uh, my site is olgarome.com and I do basically two things. I work for Tauk, I coordinate some of their tours and work as a local guide for them. And uh, private tours, most of my private tours come stem from Tauk tours because that's how people get to know me and uh, not being in competition with the Victor operator. I even took the family Tauk different times through Rome. So yes, yes, of course I do private tours. I'd love to. Could you give me that, could you give me that web address again? Yes, Olga Rome. I made it simple. Uh, OlgaRome.com. Thank you. You're most welcome. And it please, was a fabulous please. presentation. Thank you. <laughs>